means it's... Oh, only one sound. Can, can I get it again? Yeah. Yep. Problem right there. Oh, oh. Sorry, guys. Okay. But that happens with this jam. Um, what happened? What? No, oh, yeah. Um, what? Yep, no problem. Go ahead and do whatever you need. Okay. Hello. Um, I'm Jan, and I'm going to show you a little short demo of this uh, little iPhone app that you just heard, actually, with us working around here. Um, for that, I have the simulator here, because then you can actually see something. And maybe I just briefly talk something about it. Um, the idea is of that app is to have an application that enables you to do some sort of performances like that. And you can um, create a sequence or a little track or something, and you can perform it in a different way. So it's not um, actually a sequencer in the traditional styles where you set something up and you just play it back and you can't change it but it's in between a more generative um, kind of instrument and a sequencer. And the idea was already there in the 70s or something of that particular style of sequencer, which is the uh, UPIC system by Xenakis. He made that system where you can actually draw sounds and it's a quite intuitive uh, way of, of creating music and actually an intuitive way of creating uh, experimental and quite a weird music that is not so usual for most of the people. Um, so the other idea was basically um, to bring that kind of music also closer to people that don't have anything to do with that kind of music because um, a lot of people have actually a mobile phone and they're so familiar with that mobile phone because they have it like every day and it's a very private um, 
thing for most of the people. They're checking their emails and phoning people, so it's very personal for them. So as soon as they get something like that, and it's easy to use and uh, playful, and it is some sort of experimental music, they get a different relation to that kind of music. So um, I'm showing you this now, briefly. It's called Gliss. I should have mentioned this before. And actually, it has a lot to do with um, using the accelerometer in this uh, phone. It's an iPhone. And um, with the accelerometer, which means you can tilt the iPhone in uh, different directions, you can actually um, move the plate. Let's see. If I hold it like that, it won't move or very slowly. If I move it this direction, which is go in a more traditional kind of style and sequence, but I can also go backwards. And I can just draw things on it. Let's see. And now it's difficult because I don't see the screen here. Because, uh, yeah, I just touched here actually, and then I can erase it again. And I have different colors where I can draw different things. For instance, and you can also see there is another feature which actually is that you can I should do it here actually. So it's hard to see. Um, so if I move in this direction, I can move the playhead, but if I um, enable... Well, this is set up to make actually sort of pretty sequences. Um, if I go here and um, I enable some randomization of the pitch, uh, which is on the y-axis here, I can control it the randomization with also the tilt of the phone. So if I hold it like this, they will all go down. And then if I hold it straight, they will just spread around. And if I hold it like this, they will all go up. I can have... Uh, multiple of those things and just you can load in your own samples and play with it and at some future versions you will also be able to record just sounds with your phone and play around with them and I have just popped up some uh, some settings here where you can just set up the pitch of, of the different instruments and things like that. Um, Okay, so that was that short demo. Uh, in case you want to download it, it's in the App Store. And um, uh, what's it called? I have it. But uh, do I have to load samples, or can I record samples? At the moment, you can only record samples, uh, load samples. Oh, I see. Yeah, so you that's go what and, uh, I was trying to. 
Uh, so you can go actually okay. in the menu there and then go into the files. I see. And then you, you download them via, via uh, uh, Wi-Fi to your... Yeah, you go here in files and then you oh, say actually an IP address. Okay. And in that IP address you can put in your browser. Mm -hmm. And then you have like a interface to right. your uh, to the folders. The computer and computer. Computer. So you can upload uh, mm -hmm. WAP files and things like that. Okay. And in the new version, you would have also actually able to create uh, folders and just uh, upload a zip file with lots of WAP files in it and then okay. work with them. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'll just close this for now. So yeah, what I'm going to talk about today, uh, I'm Jeff Snyder. I'm the designer of the Manta, which is the instrument you see here, and uh, and s several other instruments. I'll show some of, some of my other work too in photographs. But uh, first I'm going to talk a little bit about this instrument and how it works and why I made it. Uh, so basically, this started off, this is a project I've been doing for about three years. Um, started out a while ago with extremely ugly looking prototypes that I made, um, you know, acid etching the circuit boards. And I call it, the first one I call my Soviet prototype, and it's just like, looks very uh, communist Europe. But uh, the newest version is pretty slick looking. Um, the idea is it's a touch sensitive. Um, Surface. It's kind of a, a controller for a computer. So it actually sends USB data to a computer using the HID protocol. So your computer understands it. Macs, Linux, Windows all can interpret the data. They think it's like a mouse or, or a joystick or something. So you don't need extra drivers. Um, and what I was trying to do with it, I wanted something where I could de design something that really kind of knew more about what my hands were doing than most controllers on the market. Uh, like for instance, back since 1965 or so when Robert Moog built his uh, modular synthesizer, so like Moog and Don, Robert Moog and Don Buchlo kind of uh, concurrently invented the modular synthesizer in the 60s for uh, according to most people. And Moog decided to stick an organ keyboard on it because he you know, asked some players what they wanted. And they said, oh, I'm, I'm a keyboardist. I want it to have like a piano keyboard. And then basically ever since that point, most synthesizers have had that kind of interface where you press a note, it turns on, you lift it up, it turns off. And the most information you get outside of that is you get the speed at which you press the note. So you get velocity data that tells you how hard you hit it, basically. So it's kind of like a piano. That's all the piano knows about your fingers, right? So hit it, and it's if you hit it hard, it's louder. If you hit it soft, it's softer. But then it doesn't know anything until you lift your fingers. Right? There's no more information. So you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of people who have worked on uh, ways to get around this, and so I, I kind of did my own take on it, which is somewhat inspired by uh, early work by by Don Buchla along the same lines. So he did these kind of capacitive touch sensors that he hooked up to his synthesizers, which were never as popular as they didn't take off with rock bands like Moog because it was more unfamiliar and strange. But I got really into those and I was like, oh, this is really cool. I want to make a new version of that that has a couple other features that I thought were important to me as a musician. And then also that was made to interface with my computer and portable because I live in New York City and have to go to the you know, go to gigs with on the subway so I couldn't really carry anything bulky um, so I ended up with this thing it's kind of oh, so it's about a you know it's made to be thin and small so it fits in your laptop case next to your laptop and uh, and it's bus powered so you don't need to bring around an extra power cable which is fun um, the cool thing about it is that it's if, if you can kind of see 
It's a, an array of 48 sensors. They're all hexagon-shaped sensors in a grid array. And the idea is every single sensor knows how much surface area you're covering of the sensor. So it's kind of like as you press more on the, as you cover more surface on the sensor, then, it, then a value goes up. And it's sending individual values for every single sensor to the computer. So it's got full polyphony. It understands every single sensor, what you're doing to it, which is kind of, kind of cool and different from a lot of interfaces, which are generally doing some kind of handling to limit the data down. This one just kind of sends it all and lets your computer sort it out, which is fun if you have you know, a decent amount of processing power and can figure out how to deal with that data. So for instance, in this application that I have it set up as right now, uh, it's set up to each sensor is a pitch, and then every the surface area for each sensor controls the amplitude of that particular note. So it's kind of like a keyboard where you control the volume dynamically instead of instead of a, with a attack and a decay envelope. So for instance, I can do something like this where right here I'll lower it down. So. Pretty sensitive. You can you can get a pretty almost a you know attack to from nothing to so there's a little bit of a, a threshold. So it's you know trying to avoid any low level noise. But um but yeah and the cool thing about it too is that you can you know like I said it understands all that polyphonically. So you can do. There's a lot of other ways to use it. That just happens to be the way. That's kind of the original intention of how I why I made it that way. And now a lot uh, I ended up making uh, turning it into a commercial product sort of. So I've I've sold um, I made a first edition of 60 of them and I sold sold them out a couple months ago. So now I'm working on the second edition, which is going to be 100. So uh, but pretty much I gave them out to a bunch of people and everybody else has done totally different things with it that weren't ever anything that I expected for the most part. So for instance, uh, Jan, who just spoke, he has one and is going to perform after I talk uh, with his own stuff, which I hadn't seen until today. Um, but also, Jan wrote some great code for host computer software to understand the data and route it to things like OSC and MIDI, so it can do that. Um, let's see. Oh, uh, another thing about it you may have noticed is it's got um, it's got LED feedback too, so here I'll turn this down really quick. So uh, right, right now by the default, it just turns on LEDs to indicate touch, which is kind of, kind of fun. And it helps because there's a downside of having a flat surface that doesn't doesn't have actuated keys is that you don't have the tactile feedback that lets you know I press the sensor. So I'm kind of compensating for that a little bit with the visual feedback. So it, it says, yeah, it's kind of just makes you more confident that you hit it. Um, you can kind of feel the differentiation a little bit between the sensors. It's not like a glass, straight glass surface like an iPad or something like that, um, which is nice. So you can actually kind of feel if you do this, you can feel where the sensors are and you know where you are. It's pretty subtle though. It'd be, I'm trying to figure out a way to make it a little more, a little more uh, convincing that that you can feel it. Um, yeah. Let's see. How about I show. How about I show a couple other pictures of some variations on this? Oh, yeah. One more thing I was going to say about the LEDs is that this is the default mode, is that they light up when you touch it, but then I've, it's, it can be controlled from the computer. So every LED can be kind of independently controlled to do whatever you tell it to do from the computer. And that can be, you know, you can write it in Max MSP or you can use SuperPlider if you use Jan's uh, OSC translator or something like that. Um, so maybe I'll show some pictures of some other stuff I built, and then I'll play a little example, and then Jan will do a sort of more proper performance. So here's a, let's see. So this is, um, I built these, I built this instrument for my, my concert music, which is kind of a, I've got this strange idea of this electronic, ensemble 
kind of like uh, you know the group that just performed where there's a bunch of people and they're all playing electronic instruments, but they each have their own individual sound source and that kind of thing. So I'm interested in that idea, but I also wanted to make the instruments themselves kind of feel, have the, the vibe of acoustic in instruments, just kind of feel like they have a physical presence the way that a violin does or something like that. Um, and also acoustically, all of the in I, I built these kind of resonators that are made out of wood, they're spruce, they're maple, uh, and then there's a big magnet screwed onto each of them that vibrates the spruce top plate and lets you, uh, so instead of a speaker cone pushing the air, it's actually the wood being vibrated, so the, the each instrument kind of has its own sound. And, you know, the, the downside of that is like, then you have to make a really big resonator in order to get bass response, for instance, that kind of thing, that's why a double bass is so big. But, um, but it's kind of cool to, to be able to get that kind of sound out of things. So this is, I made a couple versions of resonators for the Manta that, that take advantage of that kind of thing. So this is the one I call the Bass Manta, where it's actually got, it's got a large resonator under here, which I can show. Yeah, so this is what it looks like put together. Uh, you stand behind it, it's kind of like a pulpit. And then the top resonator is a mid-range, kind of small, small box, so that kind mm -hmm. of a buzzy mid-range thing. And then the bottom one is actually made out of a, a thick carved piece of spruce, like a double bass would be, and it has a sound post and everything. So I kind of designed it like it's a double bass. And I laser cut those nice little uh, loot roses in there. I'm very Renaissance inspired, so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I actually just I copied the design of a loot rose from a from a 16th century harpsichord. So uh, this is what it looks like from the player's perspective. So you actually the the device is just one of these, but Whenever I write for it for concert performance, I always do it as a dual, as a pair, and then just gives you uh, 96 sensors instead of 48, and the sliders on it, you get twice as many and stuff like that. So I like the way it feels that way. Um, here's what it looks like with some of the sensors lit up. And oh wait, this is actually a different one. So this is the this is the Resophonic Manta, which is another kind of resonator that I made, uh, which is like a dobro if you know that instrument. So, well, it's a brand, but they made what are called resophonic guitars in the 20s, which were a way to amplify the guitar before electric guitars were invented. And it's a, an aluminum cone that has a maple bridge that vibrates it. So I built uh, this thing, which is a resonator version, an electronic version of that, where there's the magnet suspended in front of this cone, and then it pushes the aluminum cone, a little piece of aluminum onto it. So that's got kind of a weird buzzy kind of a metallic sound to it. Here's a little close-up of how I have the cone rigged. It's kind of fun. So here's this, what's called a spider bridge, uh, pressing against the edge of the cone. And then I built a maple, a maple thing that kind of uh, replaces what would be the bridge of a dopro guitar. And then the magnet, which replaces what the strings would be doing, pushing on it. Um, here's another instrument I made, which is called the Contraviel tenor contraviel, it's like a big fake string instrument, so you push these buttons and it's like you're pressing frets on a string. Uh, so it's like four strings with 16 frets on each one. And I'm, I was kind of thinking of it like uh, keyed fiddles or hurdy-gurdies, that kind of thing, like nickel harpa, there's a, a Swedish instrument where you, where you press keys instead of fretting it. It's like a violin, you, you bow it, except instead of pushing your finger against the string, you press a key and then that pushes a tangent against the string. So I like the sound of those kind of things. They have this kind of um, uh, bagpipe kind of sound where the it, you don't have that vibrato that you get in a normal violin because you can't shake your finger or anything. So I was interested in kind of implementing that sort of idea electronically. And then I'm using the same kind of capacitive sensing over here on the left hand. Here's a picture of me holding it. So it's pretty big. And uh, here's the small one that I made. I made a treble version of it which is more violin sized. So there's a picture of me holding <laughs> as a, I perform as a, a, a as a country artist, so electronic country music. This is the instrument I play in that band. Um, <laughs> here's another instrument I made called the burl, which I don't have too much time to go into it, but it's a weird sort of wind instrument, but with uh, here's the front of it, so it looks like that from the front, and then inside, it's actually a, a motor that turns another motor 
to produce the sound, so it's electromechanical. It's uh, caused by the rotation of a stepper motor. Here's a little. Yeah. So so here's a let's see here's a close up of how how this works. So there's a basically uh, I, I discovered this when I was I used to do um, electromagnetic pickups on a motors in a in a pen plotter. So if you have like a machine that moves a stepper motor like a CNC machine or a pen plotter or something, I, I was playing around with putting pickups up against the stepper motor and it got a really, you could hear the frequency of the motor movement, which was really cool. But it's also really, um, it's kind of an aggressive sound. It's like, bzz, bzz, you know, this kind of thing. So I was interested in it, but it wasn't really that musical sounding to me. I mean, it was in a certain way, but uh, once I actually was goofing around and I had the, the pickup on the motor while I didn't have power applied and I just uh, pushed the belt by accident and it was like, woo, and I was like, hey, that's actually really nice. So I realized that if you're, if you're driving the, the shaft of the motor without pow instead of powering it, then you're just mechanically driving the motor itself, then, it, then it, it acts as a generator and produces a really nice sine wave. So, so, then, it's a, so it's a stepper? Yeah, so it's two steppers, but one of them is driving the other one. So this way, it's kind of like you're turning this motor without power applied, but it's actually this motor is turning it, and then that way you can control the frequency exactly because it's a stepper, so you can, so you can just like, you know, push it at any frequency you want. And then the reason I have to gear it is because steppers don't do very well. It's a it's a kind of motor if you're if I'm getting too confusing. But a stepper motor is a is a type of motor and it's really good for knowing for setting a particular angle or moving a particular number of steps, but it's not very good at moving fast. So audio is actually very fast, the rate of vibration, so I actually have to have a gearing system and I had to play around a lot in order to get it to to work correctly. But it's cool. It's got a really neat sound. Um yeah, that's that's the end of my pictures. Uh, questions? <laughs> that's a lot of stuff. Um, the burl? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's called the burl. Yeah. If I can, am I am I taking too much time? Let's see. Here, I'll, if I can find a YouTube video, there's a. Yeah, the concerning hobbits. No. Uh, Concerning the nature of things. So this is this is a piece I wrote for these instruments together, except that YouTube probably doesn't want to. Yeah. <laughs> trouble but uh if I can if it if it's able to get back in a little bit uh, the woman sitting over here is playing playing the electromechanical oscillator instrument which I hooked up with a breast sensor so that uh, it's because it reminded me of like a recorder and uh, so I, it just had this really pure sound so and it's monophonic it can't play more than one note at, at once so I was like oh it's kind of like a wind instrument so I hooked it up to be controlled like a wind instrument and let's see if I can show just a little audio example of what that sounds like. It takes a while for her to start to join in. Apologies for, I should have downloaded it. And the text is through her own 
Uh, it isn't. It isn't what you're thinking, though. If if uh, it is Dererum Natura, but it's. Uh, are you thinking the Greek version, or yeah. you're you, you're thinking Paracelsus? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's Paracelsus. <laughs> yeah. The, so the the text is by this uh, um, Renaissance uh, a, a German Renaissance. Um, I don't know. He's a lot of things. He's a physician. He's a natural philosopher. He's a kind of occult magic guy. So. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, he's a magician. So here she comes in. Ah, <laughs> of course. I'm gonna pause it a little bit and see if it'll load it up. But uh, so the text is about. It's it's kind of a. I actually originally it's written in German, and I I decided to find. I I, I took three texts together and I found a, a contemporary Latin translation of one of them because at the time that was the scholarly language, so he was translated. I couldn't find a Latin translation for the other one, so I had someone translate it into Latin just because I wanted that sort of uh, you know, medieval Renaissance vibe going on, and uh, Old German didn't quite get it for me. So, uh, yeah. She's the... That's her. Yeah. Sorry that it's so hard to hear in this. I don't have a new studio. I'm working on a studio recording of this, but the performance has some problems. But yeah, basically you can hear it's got a very fluty sound. Um, the pitch changes are really interesting because they they kind of whip uh, the belt drive, makes it kind of snap as it changes pitch, and it's kind of neat. I like it. It's just one of those things that you get for free when you make a physical system. That I worked really hard to get it, get rid of it, and then I was like... Actually, that's the way the instrument sounds. <laughs> so it's kind of nice. So anyway, actually, you can look at this video in your own time. But maybe I'll, I'll do a really quick example of, of how, I, how I play this, and then we'll show how Jan plays it. And maybe I'll take some questions if you got them. Or, uh, yeah, so I'll play a little bit with this, this setup where I have pitches. Uh, this one, I have pitches on every note. And then on this one, I can control. I can transpose all of those pitches with this guy, and I can also do frequency modulation. So give me a second to uh, get this out of my way. And you're using Chuck? Chuck is the software that's... Um, no, I'm using Max. So Max MSP, who, which uh, Greg Taylor, who's talking, works for. <laughs> Cycling 74. Uh, excellent, uh, excellent program. So uh, right now I've got it set up. So this one, oops, here I got it. So every 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 sensor here is a overtone series. You can get neat tunings. And then over here I can change that what the bottom pitch is. So I can do that kind of thing. Um, so I'll just play like for a minute or something.
just a short example. Sounds great. Any questions for Jeff? <laughs> yeah? Um, what are your, uh, what's your background like as far as school? Like yeah, I'm, uh, <clears throat> I'm trained in music, so I, I've studied composition for undergrad and, and uh, for grad school. I just am finishing a doctorate at Columbia in music composition. So pretty much all the engineering skills I've picked up, I've just kind of tried to teach myself. So mostly learning stuff on the internet. <laughs> I took a, hmm? yeah, woodworking. Uh, I got help from. I had a roommate who was a furniture maker for a while, and he gave me some amazing tips. And basically, I've had access to a wood shop for for a couple. For yeah, for about seven years now, which has really helped me out. So I've been just kind of getting better as I go. All my all my early instruments, when I look at them now, they're pretty pretty whack. But <laughs> lately, I've been getting a lot better. So um, my woodworking's been improving slowly. Here, actually, I'll give you this. One. Um, yeah. Can you use the mount as a controller? Uh, yeah. So it's basically, you can use it as a controller for video or anything. It just sends numbers. So it sends numbers in a, um, there's two ways to get the data into the computer. So you can, right now, it has a max MSP object that I wrote with Brad Garten. And that one, so if you have max MSP, you can get the data in really easily. And it splits everything out and shows you where it's coming from. Um, the other way to access the data is with a, a standalone application that's been written by Jan. Uh, and that routes it as OSC and MIDI. So you can select different which mode you want to do, and then any application that can understand either of those, you can you can basically uh, figure out what to do with it. Yeah. What made you decide on that particular sensor layout? Yeah, good question. Um, I don't know. I tried a lot of things. The reason I ended up going for that one is because I'm kind of interested in just intonation. And I didn't have a keyboard that was, I didn't own a keyboard. Although there are other people who dealt with kind of regularized keyboard, layout, keyboard layouts, which kind of work well for just intonation, I didn't own one of those. So I decided I wanted something that would kind of uh, allow me to play around with what are called lattice diagrams and kind of ways to organize the pitches without, um, without being restricted to a piano keyboard layout. So. Anybody else? You didn't grow up playing war games. No. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's got a lot of references that uh, you could feel from that. But um, what's the resolution for when you push it? Yep, it's uh, they're eight bit, but I lose a little bit of data because I'm 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 compensating for environmental factors. So to make sure that it doesn't change its response based on like you know the temperature or whatever. So you end up losing about. Uh, about 50, 40 of those values. So you end up with around 0, zero to 210, which you can then squish down to 0 to 127. So if you want to use it for MIDI or something. But I tend to use the full range. Um, and then the sliders are actually higher resolution. They're 12-bit. They're so you get 0 to 4096. You can get really nice like vibrato on the slider if you wrap, wrap it to pitch or something. Yeah. Um, yeah, so you have this, I guess you have, a, you have this max patch set up and you have this mapping going on between the mesh and the max patch. Mm -hmm. Do you feel pretty settled with the, where you're at with that mapping? And that Not really. I, I change it around a lot. Uh, right now, I, I, I change it from piece to piece, like when I'm writing. Uh, I've kind of, I've tried to develop just for my own music that I write for other people. I've tried to develop something of a standard because that way... So there's two people who've learned to play this the way that I'm, I do it right for it in concert. And like I don't want them to be frustrated if I change it on them. So I kind of I found something that I like that works 
that I'm using for that, but for my own stuff, I, I, keep, exper I keep experimenting and changing it. So I'm not, I'm not totally, I'm definitely not satisfied that I've found the right way to use it. So you're the best. linear scaling when you fold the 0 to 210 down to 0 to 127? Straight linear? Yeah, but it might be smarter to do something else. If you got any ideas, let me know. I mean, uh, I'd like to offer, offer different scaling things. So, you know, be able to, since you have a little bit higher resolution, you could do logarithmic things and stuff pretty easily and not lose too much data. So, yeah, that's actually a good idea. I should implement that. That's what the right hand inlet at scale up is for. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> cool. What's next for you? What's next for me? Um, uh, well, right now I'm working on the second edition of these. Well, uh, I designed them and I'm, I'm waiting for. Uh, the circuit boards to get back from the fabricator to put them together. Uh, and then, yeah, so if anybody wants to buy one, come. they'll be available April 15th from snyderphonics.com is my website. Um, and then next I'm working on a couple new products that I want to release before the end of the year, which are, uh, I want to eventually put out the electromechanical oscillator as a, as a product. I've been working on turning that, uh, changing that design and, and making it reliable enough that I could sell it as a so I made a version that's an oscillator with a built-in filter and a wave folder and stuff. So it, and that can be controlled by analog synths or MIDI. So it's kind of a, a crazy, crazy uh, device that I'm hoping maybe people Wait, who are. Wait, the wave folder is also an electromechanical. No, it's not a mechanical. No, so it's just the electromechanical oscillator, and then I'm and then because it's really sine wavy, I decided to give an option for more a richer timbre. So I'm doing an analog wave folder. That's like diode based, and then I, and then I uh, have low pass filtering after. It, so I just figured basically it costs me a lot to make that oscillator thing. You know, it's a mechanical system. It's gears. It's all this other stuff, and it has to be heavy aluminum. And I was like, okay, if I want to make this oscillator and sell it as a project, it's going to be like eight hundred dollars. And if if I sell someone a, a, something that's an oscillator with a three to four octave range for eight hundred dollars, they'll probably be upset. So I need to like put some more stuff in there. <laughs> so I added in all the analog stuff, which actually makes it really powerful. But uh, yeah, okay, great. So thanks a lot for letting me talk. Here's me on.